The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the first and the 24th chapters. Luke writes, Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. Before he ascended, Jesus said to the disciples and their companions, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my father promised, so stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up to heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple Blessing God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. (laughs) Sisters and brothers, dear friends, dear Bishop Satterley, colleagues, sisters, brothers, all grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ who told his disciples that everything written about him in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. My name is Don Chris, and I'm serving as bishop in the Southeast Michigan Synod, and so I bring you greetings from the 120 congregations and communities of the Synod, as well as from the members of my staff, Pastors Jack Eggleston and Heather Holland, Ms. Robin McCants, and Ms. Beth Fisher. I bring you greetings as well from the deans and directors of our synod who do much of the heavy lifting in terms of the ministry in Southeast Michigan. To my colleagues in Northwest Lower, I offer my thanks for your hospitality and for the work planning and coordinating this event. Traverse in the fall is a lovely place. And it was such a good idea to come up here. Thanks also to our host congregation and to all of the members who are working so hard to make us feel so welcome. We are very grateful. Which brings us at last to the texts for this evening. The reading is a sign for the feast of St. Luke, the physician, whose date was actually yesterday for those of you who are keeping track of such things. Anybody? Okay, good. And did anybody preach on those texts today? Anybody want to do it again? (laughs) I'm teasing, I'm teasing. So here's what I've got. I want to work with that passage from 2 Timothy, that appointed epistle for the Feast of St. Luke. Because when I got to getting around this sermon, those words really spoke to me. Now you know that 2 Timothy, along with 1 Timothy and the letter to Titus, form a block that scholars call the pastoral epistles. There is a general, though not universal, sense that while St. Paul is given credit in the text, he was most likely not the author. Now taken together, the pastoral epistles do some teaching and seem to give instructions and encouragement to pastors who are dealing with congregations that are not always entirely thrilled with their leadership. (laughs) 
I know that such situations never happen to us here and now, but evidently they used to. Back in the early days of the church. Now, going deeper, more specifically, 2 Timothy reads as something of a last will and testament. When you get down into it, you get a sense of the writer's readiness to lay down the burdens of the pastoral office in order to anticipate and contemplate the glories of what will come next. And having been prompted by the words from that particular lesson, I have been thinking about and remembering one of the saints of God named Arliss, a woman who was a member of the first parish that I served. Now, Arliss really was one of the saints. She was committed, dear, faithful. She regularly hosted coffee hour. And with her husband, John, she was present in worship every Sunday that they were not visiting the grandkids. We could all do, I expect, with a few more Arlises in our congregations. The price for that saintliness, however, was that Arliss was also a very good delegator. Except that Arliss didn't really delegate so much as come into my office and begin her sentences with, I think you should. <laughs> I think you should, Pastor, change the Sunday school curriculum. I think you should, Pastor, re reorganize the church council. I think you should preach on this text. I think you should build a float so that we can march in the 4th of July parade with banners so that everybody will come to church. Does that sound at all familiar to anybody else in this room? I think you should. That phrase has left a bruise <laughs> that I can still feel 22 years later. And that is where, sisters and brothers, that second lesson got to me. As for you, is how Paul starts it. And then he follows with a list of instructions that I think that, that have, I think you should, written all over them. But such a list of instructions. Be sober is how it begins, which makes you wonder a little bit about Timothy's habits <laughs> and Paul's anxieties. And then endure suffering without any mitigating explanation or suggestion that it might be possible to avoid it altogether. No, Paul seems to suggest that suffering is going to be part of the work itself. Indeed, Paul seems clear that you can't do the work unless you are prepared to suffer. For the work is hard. The work goes on. And if you do it faithfully, there will be times when your work will put you at odds with the desires and wishes of the people that you serve. Endure, Paul says. Finally, do the work of an evangelist. Carry out your ministry fully. Well, what does that mean for us here, now? What does it mean to bring out the good news of Jesus crucified and risen into the contexts and the times and the communities in which we serve? What do we have to translate? What do we have to teach? What words can we use to talk about Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God? Words that cut through all the noise and the busyness of the world around us. And how easy is any of that, really? I don't know about you, but when I get home by the end of the week, I am very ready to get into a martini, which brings me back to Paul's first instruction. <laughs> and so just when I am willing to be thoroughly put out with our elder brother Paul, 
I catch the sense of weariness. The feeling of being bone tired. The exhaustion that runs through his self-description. As for me, he says, I am already poured out as a libation and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And I have wondered what it meant for Paul, what it might mean for me, what it might mean for us to finish the race. How can Paul speak of that? And how and what exactly does he mean it? Now, I am not a runner. Some of you in this room are, and I commend you. I would run if a clown with a bloody hatchet were chasing me. <laughs> Otherwise, not so much. But I call to mind the images that I have seen, you've seen them too, of runners crossing the finish line after a long race. And there's lots of walking around with hands on hips and lots of deep breathing. And there is a lot of hugging even among fierce competitors because they know what the race cost each other. They know what it takes to get ready. They know how hard it is. That scene at the end of the race is worth thinking about when we are tempted to keep doing it all by ourselves, isn't it? Of course, that doesn't touch on the question of which race that we're running is the race. And who gets to decide? And how can you? And just when I'd like to put the whole thing to one side, there at the very end of the lesson, and preserved for 2,000 years, are Paul's very human, very poignant requests made to a partner in his ministry. Requests not for money or more training or resources or a better sound system or more flattering lighting, But at the end of that lesson, Paul acknowledges that he needs company, companionship, colleagues, friends, at least one. Do you know that feeling, sisters and brothers? Have you been there before? Oh. In the lesson we get, Luke is there. (laughs) There's not much more to be said about that at this point, although it does make you wonder how much fun he was to be with. (laughs) But Paul asks for Timothy, a friend, to come to be with him, and so that Timothy doesn't get into the same spot while he's on the journey, Paul advises him to bring Mark along with him. Go two by two, sisters and brothers. Make connections with each other, which is one of the reasons that we gather here. One of the reasons that we have built this schedule this way. One of the reasons it is so vitally important for us to gather with each other from time to time. So that we might go two by two. And let us work at making connections with our communities to discover and to take into account the needs of those who are not present in our worship or in our classrooms or even on our radars. And let us learn and talk and share together about what is working and about what is not. Let us build up the body of Christ that has been given into our care. I think we should do that. 
Amen. Amen.